Hello friends, I welcome you to this episode of Learning Physics with me. IBM is my name and today I would like to take you to another episode of uh, Solved Past Paper Questions. This is without wasting time going to be about a simple unit that we normally think is very hard but it's quite very easy. That's work, energy and power. It's quite very easy. Remember, this is AS Physics, Solved Past Paper Questions, and this is going to be part one of this video. I don't know how many parts there will be, but uh, this is part one. So do not forget to share these videos with your classmates so that they can also uh, uh, try to practice the Solved Past Paper Questions. Uh, I have also uh, accomplished Paper 1, Past Paper Questions per topic, and I'll be uploading them on the Google Drive and I will share the link in the video description for those who will be interested in practicing multiple choice questions. Remember towards exams in May, June, there are almost eight days of uh, multiple choice questions. For those who have only physics, you can spend eight days just practicing the multiple paper choice questions. I mean the multi choice, the multiple choice paper, past paper questions that I'm going to upload uh, in, a, in a short period of time. So for now, uh, let's concentrate on work, energy, and power. Throughout this unit, throughout this unit, you will see you'll be seeing questions about um, work done, uh, power, kinetic energy, potential energy, elastic potential energy, efficiency, and you expect a lot more from this uh, <clears throat> from this video. So without wasting time, allow me to take you to the past hour document, the solved, uh, the past paper questions that we are going to solve just now. So this is the document, Master Kit A-Level Physics, revision questions that is in paper two. And uh, we are going, this is the table of content. Remember, we have already finished. We have already uploaded a video of physical quantities and units. We have finished dynamics. We have, I think, finished um, waves. We have finished particle physics. I think we have finished the formation of solids. And now we are looking at um, work, energy, and power. So we are here. Work, energy, and power. That means we shall be left with four, uh, three videos, kinematics, force density, and pressure, and electricity, because those are the longest videos. So I decided to record the shortest first. The shortest videos first so of course next is most likely going to be force density and pressure followed by kinematics and electricity will be will come last because i think it is the longest here so without wasting time let's look for work energy and power on page 197 page 197 so we are here work energy and power and we have started so state what is meant by work, by work done. State what is meant by work done. Maybe I should reduce the thickness. So we know that work done is the product of force and displacement in the direction of, of the force. Work is only done when a force causes an object to move in the same direction as the force. Therefore, we shall define work done as simply force times displacement displacement in the direction of the force. So that's work done. Force times displacement in the direction of the force. A beach ball is released from a balcony at the top of the tall building. The ball falls vertically from rest. Initial velocity is zero and reaches a constant terminal velocity. We know what, what we mean by terminal velocity. There, the acceleration is zero. The gravitational potential energy of the ball decreases by, <coughs> that is the decrease in the gravitational potential energy as it falls to the ground. The ball hits the ground with this speed, 16 meters per second, and the kinetic energy is 23 joules. Show that the mass of the ball is 0 0.18 kilograms. Since they have given us the kinetic energy with which it hits the ground with its speed, we can find the mass from that expression, from that those quantities. So kinetic energy EK 
is equal to a half m v squared. So the kinetic energy has been given as 23 joules, which will be equal to a half times the mass times the speed with which it lands, that is 16 squared. So we make m the subject. Of course, as a math student, here you just say m is equal to 2 times 23 divided by 16 squared. So we shall check this on the calculator. So we have 2 times 23 divided by 16 squared. And that is 0 0.1797. 0 0.1797 which is approximately 0 0.18 in kilograms calculate the height of the balcony above the ground since we want the height by all means we need to bring in the concept of gravitational potential energy they have given us a decrease in gravitational potential energy as 60 joules so the decrease in gravitational potential energy is equal to mg times the change in height so the decrease is 60 joules. We have already got them. Oh, they have given us the mass is 0 0.18. G is acceleration of free fall, which is 9.81 times the value of H. So we shall just divide both sides from our calculator. We shall say 60 divided by open brackets 0 0.18 times 9.81. So this is giving us 33.98. So H is equal to 33.98, which is approximately 34 meters. Determine the average resistive force. Resistive force. That is a kind of good reflection. <coughs> Determine the average resistive force acting on the ball as it falls from the balcony to the ground. So we need to, do, to find the work which is done against the resistive force. Note that the, the loss in gravitational potential energy is 60, but the kinetic energy is, is actually 20, 23. That means not all, not all the loss in gravitational potential energy becomes kinetic energy when the ball hits the ground. So there is some work, some energy which is lost to overcome the resistive force, and which work is done against the resistive force. So we shall begin with the work done against the resistive force. And this work done must therefore be 60 joules minus 23, which is equal to, I think that is 37 joules. That is the work which is not converted into kinetic energy. It is used to overcome the force of resistance. Since work done is force times displacement, force times displacement in the direction of the force, so it means the force that we want, which is the resistive force, I'll call it FR for resistive, is going to be the work done divided by the distance or displacement, which is 37 divided by the distance. So it is falling through this height. So I'll say 37 divided by 33.97 or 98. So we can check this on the calculator, 37 divided by 33.98, and that is 1.089, which is approximately 1.1. So this is 1.1. State and explain the variation, if any, in the magnitude of the acceleration of the ball in B. During the time interval when the ball is moving downwards, before it reaches constant velocity. Before it reaches constant velocity. We want to see the magnitude of acceleration. If any. So let's think about this ball when it is falling downwards. Its weight is acting vertically downwards and the weight is constant. The force due to air resistance is vertically upwards, and this force increases as the speed downwards increases. Because the force upwards increases, yet the force downwards does not increase, it means the resultant force actually decreases. 
And if the resultant force decreases, remember, acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force. If the resultant force decreases, it means the acceleration also decreases. Of course, at terminal velocity, the acceleration becomes zero. The resultant force is the difference between the weight downwards and the force due to air resistance upwards. Therefore, we can say air resistance Air resistance acting on the ball acting on the ball increases with the speed. It increases with the speed, and since And since the weight is constant, and since the weight is constant, the resultant force on the ball decreases. The resultant force on the ball decreases. Remember force is equal to mass times acceleration. We have already seen that the resultant force decreases, hence the acceleration decreases. Okay, so that is um, that is what we can say about the magnitude of the acceleration. In fact, it decreases. The weight downwards is not changing, but the force due to air resistance upwards is increasing as the speed downwards increases. And since the resultant force is sub got by subtracting weight minus force due to air resistance, it means the resultant force decreases. And if the resultant force decreases, it also means the acceleration decreases. The person uses a trolley to move a suitcase at an airport. The total mass of the trolley and the suitcase is 72 kilograms. The person pushes the trolley and the suitcase along a horizontal surface with a constant speed, constant speed, 1.4 meters per second, and then releases, releases the trolley. The released trolley moves in a straight line and comes to rest. Assume that a constant res total resistive force of 18 newtons opposes the motion of the trolley and the suitcase. Calculate the power required to overcome the total resistive force on the trolley. Power to overcome the total resistive force on the trolley when it is moving at a constant speed of 1.4. So we already know that power is equal to force times velocity, where this is going to be the force. The force is 18 newtons. The velocity is 1.4. So that one we just press our calculator, 1.4 times 18 which gives us 25.2. So that is 25.2. Uh, so the power here is 25.2, or approximately 25. Calculate the time taken for the troll to come to rest after it is released. Note that when it is released, it is moving with a speed of 1.4. Then if it comes to rest, final velocity is going to be zero. So we can begin by finding uh, the acceleration the acceleration, the acceleration is equal to force, resultant force over the mass, and the force is, uh, since it is only the when it is released, it is only the resistive force acting, so it means the resistive force is the resultant force, which is 18 uh, newtons, then the mass of the trolley is 72 kilograms. Remember, this force is the resistive force. 
Therefore, this acceleration is going to be a negative acceleration, which when I press my calculator, that is 18 divided by 72. That is a quarter, which is 0 0.25. So it is negative 0 0.25. It is actually coming to rest. That negative means a deceleration. So we want time. So we can use the equation of motion, V equals to U plus AT. When it comes to rest, V is 0. But it comes to rest when it was initially moving with a speed of 1.4. Plus, the acceleration is negative 0 0.25, then times T. So you notice that T is going to be 1.4 divided by 0 0.25. So we check 1.4 divided by 0 0.25. And that gives us 5.6. So this is 5.6 seconds another place in the airport the trolley and the suitcase are on a slope the trolley and the suitcases are on a slope as shown here so the person releases the trolley from rest again at point x so initial velocity at x is zero the troll moves down the slope in a straight line towards point Y. The distance along the slope between the two points is 9.5 meters. The component F of the weight of the trolley and the suitcase that acts along the slope is 54. Assume that a constant total resistive force of 18 newtons opposes the motion of the trolley and the suitcases calculate the speed of the trolley at point Y. So, first of all, we need to find the resultant force on the trolley, which is going to be responsible for the acceleration. There are resistive forces along the plane, which is of 18 newtons. Then there is a forward force, which is of 54 newtons. So, what is the resultant force in this case? So that we can be able to find the acceleration between x and y. So, resultant force. The resultant force in this case is going to be 54 minus the resistance which is 18 that is the resultant force but we know that acceleration is equal to the resultant force so i'll call this fr to mean resultant force over the mass so the resultant force is 54 minus 18 then we divide this by the mass the mass has not changed it's still 72 so this gives us the acceleration and i think this is 54 minus 18 divided by 72. I think that is 0 0.5. So the acceleration is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. That is down the slope. So now we can find the speed. We can use equations of motion. For example, since we have displacement, we have um, initial velocity. We have the initial velocity as 0 because it was released from rest. So it means we can find the velocity at y using the equations of motion since the acceleration is constant. So we are going to find uh, the speed using v squared equals to u squared plus 2as. So v squared is going to be 0 squared plus 2 times the acceleration which is 0 0.5 then times the distance which is 9.5. So this is going to give us V, so 2 times 0 0.5 plus 9.5, sorry, times, times 9.5, so that's what we get. Then we find um, the square root, square root of the answer, which is 3.08, which is 3.1. So V is equal to 3.08 or approximately 3.1. Calculate the work done by F for the movement of the trolley from X to Y. Work done, we now know that work done is force times distance in the direction of force. Now this time we shall have, we, shall need, we need the forward force. The total forward force which is 1 accelerating the object and 2 doing work against resistance which is simply going to be 54 newtons. 
So this is going to be this if these notes when you are finding work are done, you don't need the, you don't use the resultant force. You want to work done actually by F, which is 54. So work done by F is going to be 54 times the distance moved, which is 9.5. And when I press my calculator, 54 times 9.5. That is 513, or oh, approximately I can write 510 joules, two, two significant figures. Then the trolley is released at point X. Remember initial velocity is zero. At T equals to zero. That means the distance is initially zero. There is no work done initially. Sketch a graph to show the variation with the time t of the work done by the force by f for the movement of the trolley from x to y. First of all, the graph will start from the origin because at t equals to zero, our distance is zero. But then as time goes on, we have seen that the distance increases. That means the work done increases. But I want you to note, I want you to note that um, Power is equal to work done over time taken. And it means when I sketch a graph of work done against uh, time, it means the gradient is power. The gradient is power. But because the speed is increasing, because the speed is increasing, then it means um, this graph is going to have a gradient which is actually going to be increasing so that we demonstrate the fact that uh, the when the speed increases, the power is actually going to be uh, increased. The power is going to increase. So this is going to be a curve going upwards. This is going to be a curve with increasing gradient. So there's going to be a curved line from the origin because at t equals to zero, there's no work done, distance is zero. But as time goes on, there's work done and the distance increases rapidly. Of course, the speed is going to increase. So the work done, the graph of work done against time is going to be a curve going upwards. Then the angle of the slope in the B is constant. The frictional forces acting on the wheels of the moving tray are also constant. Explain why in practice it is incorrect to assume that the total resistive force opposing the motion of the trolley and the suitcase is constant as the trolley moves between X and Y. The total resistive force cannot be constant simply because as the trolley moves between X and Y, it is going to speed up, it is going to accelerate. And as it speeds up, air resistance increases with, with the speed. So the total resistive force cannot be constant. So we know that the force due to air resistance the force due to air resistance increases increases the force due to air resistance increases with the speed so total resistive force is not constant Total resistive force cannot be constant. A child of weight 330 is at a point X at the top of a slide. The child, the slide is at the edge of a swimming pool as shown in the figure. The child moves from rest to the lowest point of the slide. That is a vertical distance 4 meters below X. The child continues moving towards point Y 
which is at the end of the slide and the vertical di uh, distance 1.1 meters above the lowest point. The kinetic energy of the child is at Y is 5, 5, 540 joules. Calculate the difference in gravitational potential energy of the child at point X and Y. Difference in gravitational potential energy. I think that is easy. The change in gravitational potential energy is going to be mg times the change in height h. Of course, mg is weight. I think uh, if they didn't give us mass, they gave us the weight of the child. mg is weight, so that can be also be weight times change in the value of h. So this is going to be the weight, which is 330 times the change in the value of h. The difference is 4.0 minus 1.1. Which gives us 330 times 4 minus 1.1. So this is giving us 957, which is approximately 960 joules. Then an average frictional force of 52 newtons acts on the child when moving from x to y. By considering changes of energy, Determine the distance moved by the child from x to y. So there is an average friction force which opposes motion. So that we expect that the change in the work at that, the change in the gravitational potential energy should be equal to the work done against friction plus the gain in kinetic energy. Therefore, the work done against friction is going to be actually the difference in the, uh, the gravitational potential energy and the work done against uh, all the energy at, at, at Y. If, all, if not all the energy, if not all the energy at point X becomes kinetic energy plus potential energy at point Y, then we can find the work done against uh, friction or against resistance. So work done, Againest, um, work done against friction is equal to, so the difference in gravitational potential energy is 960, but the potential energy, the kinetic energy at point Y is only 540. So that would be 960 minus 540. So this is going to be, um, 960 minus 540, that is going to give us 420 joules. But that is the work done against friction. So the work done is equal to force times distance. So we want the distance. So distance is going to be the work done, which is 420, divided by the friction of force, which is 52. So that is 8.08 or approximately 8.1. The child leaves the slide at point Y with a velocity uh, that is at an angle of 41 degrees to the horizontal. The path of the child through the air is shown in the figure. Point Z is the highest point on the path of the child through the air. Assume that air resistance is negligible. Actually, the speed of the child at point Y, at point Y, just here. So, um, because the child at point Y has kinetic energy of 540 joules, we can find the speed at point Y. So kinetic energy EK is equal to a half m v squared. We don't have the mass of the child, but we know that the mass is going to be the weight divided by G, which weight is 330 divided by G, which is 9.81. 
So kinetic energy which is 540 at point Y is equal to a half times the mass of the child which is 330 divided by 9.81 times the speed which is V squared. So we want to find V squared. We want to find V. So I'll just use my calculator and I say uh, 540 times 2 times 9.81, I'm cross multiplying. Then I divide by 330. Then I find the square root. So I'm getting V as 5.666 or 5.67 or 5.7. So the speed V is equal to 5.7. Okay, then at point Z, at point Z, at point Z, so we have v, we have the speed here as 5.7, let's say 5.7 here, and we want the speed at Z, Z in the vertical, Z, if Z is the highest point using projectiles, speed in the vertical will be zero, but speed in the horizontal will be the same as the speed at Y in the horizontal, where, where, where it means we just resolve the horizontal component of v so speed speed here is going to be equal to the horizontal component horizontal component of velocity at x remember the velocity uh, in the y is zero at the highest point v is 0 in the highest at the highest point we want v in the x so speed in the x is going to be equal to 5.7 when i resolve uh, 5.7 to the horizontal that will be 5.7 cos cos of 41 5.7 cos 41 that gives us 4.3 so the speed is 4.3. Remember the velocity in the horizontal does not change because there is no resultant force in the horizontal. The only force acting is the force due to gravity which acts in the vertical. The variation with the extension x of the force f applied to a spring is shown here. So it is f against x. You might have answered some of these questions because there is no clear boundary between uh, most of these topics. Some of the questions overlap. The spring has an unstretched length of 0 0.8 and is suspended vertically from a fixed point as shown in the figure. So we see in position x, the length of the spring is that. So the extension here is going to be 0 0.095 minus 0 0.080, which is 0 0.015 meters. Then in position y, the extension here is going to be 0 0.120 minus 0 0.080, which I think is 0 0.04. Is it? Sorry. So this is 0 0.012 minus 0 0.08. Zero point one two minus zero point zero eight zero point zero four millimeters. The block hangs in equilibrium at point X. The block is then pulled vertical downwards and held at position Y, so that the length of the spring is. 0 0.12 meters as shown in the figure 4.4. The block is then released and moves vertically upwards from position Y back towards position X. Use the figure to determine the spring constant of, of the spring. So in position A, I mean position X, in position X the extension is 0 0.015. 
in position y the extension is 0 0.04 from the graph we can find uh, the spring constant we can find the spring constant using Hooke's law I can use the full length of the graph the full length of the graph this is 0 0.05 against uh, the other one is 4 so I'll just simply find a gradient from Hooke's law is equal to k times the extension or the extension is equal to force over um, I mean the constant equals force over extension which is the same as the gradient it is the same as the gradient so when I substitute k is going to be 4.0 from the graph minus 0 the origin over 0 0.050 minus 0 which is the origin when I check my calculator 4 divided by 0 0.05 that is 80 so spring constant is 80 so using figure 4.1 we have found a spring constant using figure 4.1 uh, use figure 4.1 to show that the decrease in elastic potential energy is 0 0.055 joules when the block moves back from position y to position x let's look for position y at position x the extension was 0 0.015 which is in the middle here 1 2 3 4 5 that is position x 0 0.015 then at position y the extension was 0 .00, 0 0.04 so this is where the extension for position y so we want the change in gravity in elastic elastic potential energy which is going to be uh, precisely the area under this part of the graph that is the area under that part of the graph so we can use on the x axis on the y axis this value is uh, i think this is 1.2 because the scale is 0 0.1 then this one I think this is 3.2 so we can use any expression we can use area under the graph we can use uh, hook, uh, uh, elastic potential energy is equal to a half f times x or we can use a half kx squared since we have we have k or we can use the area under the graph so let me start with um, the first one so energy difference in energy is going to be a half times f at 0 0.04 f is 3.2 times the extension which is 0 0.04 minus a half at 0 0.015 it was 1.2 the extension is 0 0.015 we can check this uh, I'll open the brackets a half is 0 0.5 times 3.2 times 0 0.04 minus open another bracket a half is 0 0.5 times 1.2 times 0 0.015 so this is giving us 0 0.0 I can check another method the change in energy is equal to a half I'm using this one so k is 880 uh, x squared for the for the first part x squared this is going to be times 0 0.04 minus a half times k which is 80 the second part of x is 0 0.015 you can still check this open brackets 0 0.5 times 80 times oh, by the way this is squared so times 0 0.04 squared minus open another bracket 0 0.5 times 80 times 0 0.015 squared which is the same 0 0.055 I'm now going to use the area under the graph so 
this is equal to the area under the graph it is a trapezium a half uh, i always don't like writing here the formula b a plus b times h but i'll write it there a half into let's find a so somebody can say this is a which is this is a the other side is b and this is h h is from 0 0.015 to 0 0.04 so we are going to substitute A. A we say it is 1.2, B we say it is 3.2, and H is from 0 0.04 to 0 0.015. So let's check this again. 1.2 plus 3.2, that is 4.4. .4, so I say 0 0.5 times 4.4, .4, then times the difference 0 0.04 minus 0 0.015. And it is giving us the same thing, 0 0.055 joules. So any of those methods could work for you. The block has a mass of 0 0.122 kilograms. Calculate the increase in the gravitational potential energy of the block for its movement from point Y to point X. Point Y is 0 0.04, point X is 0. Point, um, no, point Y was uh, 0 0.120, point X was 0 0.095. So we shall get the difference between these two points because we want movement from Y to X. So a change in gravitational potential energy is going to be equal to mg times change in the value of h. So the mass is 0 0.122 times 9.81 times the difference in h, which is 0 0.120 minus 0 0.095. So we check our calculator, 0 0.122 times 9.81 times 0 0.12 minus 0 0.095 close the brackets so we are getting this as 0 0.0229 0 0.0229 0 So this is, I think, approximately 0 0.30. So I'll just write here 0 0.030 to two significant figures. Use the decrease in elastic potential energy in B and your answer in C to determine for the block as it moves through point X, its kinetic energy. So we have seen the increase in gravitational potential energy. Yet in part B, we have seen um, the decrease in elastic potential energy. So it means not all the, de the increase, the decrease in elastic potential energy is not all becoming um, an increase in gravitational potential energy. It means part of it is becoming kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is going to be simply the difference, which is 0 0.055 minus 0 0.030, which gives us... 0 0.055 minus 0 0.030, which is 0 0.025. Then its speed. Since we have kinetic energy, speed is now easy. Kinetic energy is a half m v squared. So making v the subject, v is going to be the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy, which is 0 0.025. Divide by the mass of the ball, which was 0 0.122. So 2 times 0 0.025 divided by 0 0.122. Then we get the square root of the answer. That is 0 0.64. So this is 0 0.64 meters per second. State what is meant by work done. By now, you now know that work done is force times displacement in the direction of the force.
force times displacement in the direction of the force. Okay. A lift uh, of weight, 13.0 kN. We know that the weight acts vertically downwards. So this is the weight, which is 13.0 kN. Is connected, to a, by, is connected by a cable to a motor as shown in the figure. So there must be a tension in this cable, which I will call T. Okay. The lift is pulled up, is pulled, the lift is pulled up a vertical shaft by the cable. So it means motion is upwards. Motion is upwards. Motion is upwards. A constant frictional force of 2.0 kN acts on the lift. The frictional force must be acting downwards because the movement is the upwards. So we have friction of 2.0 kilonewtons downwards because the motion is upwards. Friction tends to oppose motion. The variation with the time t of the speed v of the lift is shown in the figure. Use the figure to determine the acceleration of the lift between t equals to 0 to t equals 3 seconds. This is velocity against time. The acceleration is the gradient. t equals to 0 to t equals to 3. You just find the gradient of that straight line. So acceleration is equal to the gradient. Oh, by the way, it can be equal to change in velocity with the time. Or you can just write change in V over time. So the acceleration is going to be equal to, from the graph, I think this is the scale on the vertical is 1 divided by 10. That is 0 0.1. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4. That is 2.4. So it is 2.4 minus 0 divided by, on the x-axis we have 3 minus 0. So we have 2.4 divided by 3, which is 0 0.80. So the acceleration is 0 0.80. Then the work done by the motor to raise the lift between t equals 3 and t equals 6 t equals to 3 and t equals to 6. From the graph, we see that v is constant. If v is constant, it means the resultant force is 0. Here v is constant between the 3 and 6. The resultant force is 0. That means the, the sum of the weight downwards plus the friction force downwards should be called the tension in the cable which is going to be actually the work done by the motor. So it means the resultant force is zero when V is constant. So the tension in the cable is going to be called the weight plus uh, the frictional force downwards. So I'm saying between that time V is constant. which means the force, which is the resultant force, is equal to zero. Since when V is constant, it means acceleration is zero. This, therefore, implies that the tension, the tension in the cable, the tension in the cable is going to be the weight downwards plus the frictional force, which will be the weight is 13 plus the frictional force, which is 2, and this is times 10 power 3, which is, I think, 15 times 10 power 3 newtons. That is the tension in the cable. So let's see the work done is equal to the force times the distance. So this is going to be the force is going to be 15 times 10 power 3, then times the distance through which it moves. Distance is going to be uh, the area under this graph. So the distance move is the area under this part between um, 3 and 6, which is actually a triangle, I mean a rectangle. So I would say this is, remember, 2.4. This distance is 3. So the area under that graph is the distance. So this is going to be 3.0 times 2.4. That is the distance. So we shall check on our calculator 15 times... 15 exponent 3 times 3 times 2.4. So 
So that is 10,800. 10,800. Is it 10,800? Let me check. It is 10,8,000. So this is approximately 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is approximately 1.1 times 10 power times 10 power 5. So that is going to be the work done. Now our next part. So in our next part, uh, the power, uh, the motor has efficiency 6.67 uh, and the tension is 1.6 times 10 power 4. Determine the input power uh, to the motor at this time. So we can go back and look for 2.5 from our graph. So this is 1, 2, the scale on the x-axis is 1 divided by 5, which is 0 0.2. So this is going to be 2.5 is somewhere here. So you look at your graph and you notice that 2.5 is corresponding with a speed of 2.0. So it means um, it means the speed we are going to use at that time is 2.0. So let's try this. So power is going to be equal to force times velocity. That is the power. But at a time of 2.5 seconds, the velocity is 2.0 meters per second. And that is from the graph. We have seen that from the graph, that uh, at 2.5 seconds, the speed is 2.0 meters per second. So we can find the efficiency. Efficiency is going to be equal to We know efficiency is uh, the output power over the input power. Output power divided by the input power. So the efficiency is 67%. So we shall say 67% is 67 over 100, which is 0 0.67. The output power, of course, we have the tension in the cable is 1.6 and the speed is going to be 2 meters per second. So the output power is going to be 1.6 times 10 power 4 times the, the speed, which is 2.0 meters per second, divided by the input power. So it means our input power. is going to be equal to 1.6 times 10 power 4 times 2.0 divided by 0 0.67. So 1.6 times, sorry, 1.6 exponent 4, then times, times 2 divided by 0 0.67. So we are getting 4,761. 4, so the input power is 47,761 and so on in watts. So I'll write this as 4.8 times 10 power 4. So that is the input power. State and explain whether the increase in um, whether the increase in the gravitational potential energy of the lift from t equals to zero to t equals to seven seconds is less than the same as or greater than the work done by the motor. Between t equals to zero to t equals to seven. State and explain whether the increase in the gravitational potential energy of the lift from t equals to zero to t equals to seven is less than the same as or greater than the work done by the motor. Of course, um, 
as the speed increases, as the speed increases, we know that the resistive force uh, also increases in the opposite direction. So it means more work is going to be done against the friction. So it means the increase in gravitational potential energy that we have considered is actually going to be less, is less than the actual increase in gravitational potential energy. So we can say some work is done against the friction. Some work is done against friction or resistance. So the increase, the increase in gravitational potential energy is less than, is less than the work. done by the motor. So the increase in gravitational potential energy is actually going to be less than the work done by the motor because some of the work done by the motor is, is wasted in overcoming uh, resistance or friction. Some of the work is wasted in overcoming resistance or friction. State what is meant by work done. At this point now, we know that work done is force times displacement in the direction of the force. Then uh, what is meant by elastic potential energy? We know that elastic potential energy is always stored in a deformed material, a material which has been compressed, a material which has been stretched, a material whose shape has been changed. The energy stored in such an object is what we call the elastic potential energy. So this is energy stored in an object. Due to, due to extension, if it has been stretched, it is, can be due to extension, it can be due to compression, it can be due to change of shape. So we can precisely say energy stored in an object or energy stored in, an, in a deformed object, that is elastic potential energy. Energy stored in a stretched material, energy stored in a deformed material, energy stored in a compressed material, energy stored in a stretched material, energy stored in a material whose shape has been changed, that is elastic potential energy. Oh, by the way, I have remembered, in the previous part, the motor also, by the way, lifts the cable. The cable does not lift itself. The cable connecting um, the cable connecting the lift to the motor is also lifted. So that means the work of the of the motor, some of it is used to lift the cable itself. So it means some work is done in lifting the cable itself. I can add it here. Some work. is done in lifting the cable itself. So it means the increase, the increase in gravitational potential energy is less. It means some work which is used to lift the cable itself does not become an increase in gravitational potential energy. So it is it is actually useless. A block of mass 0.4 kilograms slides in a straight line with a constant speed 
0.3 meters per second along a horizontal surface as shown in the figure here. The block hits the spring and it decelerates. The speed of the block becomes zero when the spring compressed is compressed by eight centimeters. Initial kinetic energy of the block. So we know kinetic energy E3 is equal to a half m v squared. So this is a half times the mass. The mass of the block is 0 0.4. And of course, its speed is 0 0.03, and this is squared. So we just press this in our calculator. A half times 0 0.4 times 0 0.03 squared. So it is 0 0.3, not 0 0.03. So this is 0 0.3 squared. So 0 0.3 squared. So that is 0 0.018, or it is 1.8 times 10 power negative 2 in joules. The variation of the compression x of the spring with the force f applied to the spring is shown in the figure. Use the figure, use your answer to determine the maximum force f max exerted on the spring by the block. Explain your working. Of course, when this block is moving, if resistance is ignored, it means uh, the change in kinetic energy becomes the work done on the spring, which is going to be the last potential energy. So since they said explain your working, we shall say change or loss in kinetic energy is going to be equal to the work done on the spring. which is going to be the elastic potential energy. So the change in the kinetic energy is 1.8 times 10 power negative 2. We have graduated this above. The work done, which becomes elastic potential energy, is a half F max times the extension X times X. So it means 0 0.018 is going to be equal to a half F max I'm using the expression for elastic potential energy. Then times uh, the, the extension here is 8.0, which is 0 0.08 millimeters. So we check, we make F max the subject. So I'll say that one times two, divided by 0 0.08. So this is going to be 0 0.45. So F max is 0 0.45. Calculate the maximum deceleration of the block. Maximum deceleration. So we have that acceleration or deceleration is the resultant force divided by the mass. Since the, uh, the maximum resultant force is 0 0.45, so it means the maximum deceleration is going to be 0 0.45 divided by the mass of the block, which was given as 0 0.40. So we check 0 0.45 divided by 0 0.4, and that is 1.1. So this is going to be 1.1. One. State and explain whether the block is in equilibrium before it hits the spring. Let's check. Before it hits the spring, before it hits the spring, it was moving with a constant speed. So it means it was in equilibrium. After it hits the spring, it decelerates. It means the force is not constant. It is actually, uh, the speed is decreasing. That means the resultant force is not zero when the speed is decreasing. So it is not in equilibrium. So before, there's a constant velocity, constant velocity, or constant speed, 
means resultant force is zero. The resultant force is zero. And if the resultant force is zero, so it is in equilibrium. So it is in equilibrium. Then in the second case, where after it has hit, so, so when its speed becomes zero, it is actually decelerating. It is decelerating. It is decelerating, and if it is decelerating, it means the resultant force is not zero. Resultant force is not. Resultant force is not zero, so not in equilibrium. So not in equilibrium. Okay. The energy E is stored in a spring is given by that expression where K is the spring constant of the spring and X is its compression. The mass M of the block in B is now varied. The initial kinetic energy of the block remains constant and the spring constant the spring continues to obey Hooke's law. On the figure sketch the variation of maximum compression of the spring with uh, with the mass m. Remember uh, the loss in kinetic energy which is a half m v squared is directly proportional to the loss in kinetic energy becomes the gain in elastic potential energy. So we can say that a half m v squared should be equal to a half k x squared. And we are sketching a graph of x naught, which is the maximum compression against m. So it means, uh, of course, there will be a limit on the value of x naught. Don't uh, we cannot believe that you just every time you increase the mass, the compression will continue. Uh, indefinitely, not at all. But as M increases initially, the compression also increases. But if M will increase, there will be a point where the more you increase M, there will be no change in the compression. That means we shall have a graph whose gradient is becoming horizontal, and at a certain point, it is going to be perfectly horizontal. The compression decreases, I mean, the compression increases until the material cannot be compressed anymore. The compression increases until the material cannot be compressed anymore. Therefore, the graph becomes a horizontal line as M increases further and further. Explain what is meant by work done. Work done is force times displacement. in the direction of the force. It's force times a displacement in the direction of the force. Then we know kinetic energy, of course, the energy of a mass or a body due to its motion, due to its speed, or due to its movement. Energy of a mass. Energy of a mass or a ma of a body due to its motion or due to motion. or due to speed, that is kinetic energy. Energy of a body or of a mass due to its motion or due to its speed, that is uh, kinetic energy. A leisure park ride consists of a carriage that moves along a railed track. Part of the track lies in a vertical plane and follows an arc, x, y. 
of a circle of radius 13 meters as shown here. So this mass is 580. The mass of the carriage is 580 at point X. The carriage has velocity 22 meters per second in the horizontal direction. The velocity of the carriage then decreases to 12 meters per second in a vertical direction. For the carriage moving from X to Y, show that the decrease in kinetic energy is 9.9 .9 times 10 power 4 joules. Decrease in kinetic energy. For we know that kinetic energy is a half m v squared. Now we want the decrease, that is the change in kinetic energy. The change in kinetic energy is going to be a half times the mass is 580, but the velocity changes. So we are moving from 22 squared minus 12 squared. Or you can find the kinetic energy using the first velocity. You get the kinetic energy using the second velocity and you subtract. So let's try to subtract this. So a half is 0 0.5 times 580 times the difference 22 squared minus 12 squared. So that is 98600. 98600 joules which is approximately 9.9 .9 times 10 power 1, 2, 3, 4, power 4 joules. It is wrong to find change in kinetic energy by doing this. A half times 580 into 22 minus 12, and you square this. That is wrong mathematics. That is wrong mathematics. We are finding a change in kinetic energy. Find the initial kinetic energy, the final kinetic energy, and subtract. It is the same as squaring both values of V, then subtracting them. Then the gain in gravitational potential energy. So the gain in gravitational potential energy can be given by mg times the difference in the height. So this is going to be m, which is 580, g, which is 9.81, times the height h. So the vertical height is just going to be the radius. The vertical height between x and y is just the radius, which is 13 meters. So this is going to be 13. So 580 times 9.81 times 13. So that is 73967. 73967.4 which is actually 7.4 times 10 power 1 2 3 4 so that is 7.4 times 10 power 4 joules show that the length of the track from x to y is 20 meters the length of the track. You see that it is a, a quarter of a circle. It is a quarter of a circle. And we want to find the length from x to y, which is circumference. If it was a full circle, the circumference of a circle is, I think, pi d, which is the same as 2 pi r. That is the circumference of the full circle. But now this is a quarter of a circle, so this will be divided by 4. So that will be 2 pi r over 4. So the length equals to the circumference. Which is going to be equal to a quarter of pi d. Or to be a quarter into 2 pi r. Which is going to be a quarter into 2 pi times the radius which is 13 so we check with the calculator a quarter that is um, a quarter a quarter times 2 pi times 13 
which is 20.4 so this is 20.4 which is approximately 20 Use your answers in B Roman 1 and B Roman 2 to catch the average resistive force acting on the carriage as it moves from X to Y. So we now know the length of the, of the path, we know the distance. We see the gain in gravitational potential energy and we see, uh, we see the decrease in kinetic energy. And we see that the decrease in kinetic energy is not becoming the gain in gravitational potential energy. So that means we shall now find a difference. We shall find a difference. So use your answer in B. So in B Roman 1, we have uh, the decrease in kinetic energy. In B Roman 2, we have um, we have actually uh, the length of the truck. So we can now find the average, the average resistive force. To find the force, resistive force, we need the work done against resistance. So work done, work done against resistance. Work done against resistance force is simply going to be the difference which is 9.9 .9 times 10 power, power 4, minus 7.4 times 10 power 4, which I think this is 9.9 .9 minus 7.4, that is 2.5. So that is 2.5 times 10 power 4. That is the uh, work done against resistance, but work done is force times distance. That means the resistive force, which I will call FR, should be the work done divided by the distance. So that is going to be 2.5 times 10 power 4 divided by the distance, which is approximately 20 or 20.4. So we can check 2.5 exponent 4 divided by 20 which is 1250 so that is 1250 or approximately 1300 newtons to two significant figures describe the change describe the change in the direction of the linear momentum of the carriage as it moves from x to y so at x it is moving in the horizontal, the momentum is in the horizontal. Then at y it is moving in the vertical, the moment is changing is in the vertical. So the change in momentum is from the horizontal to the vertical, from horizontal to vertical. So that is the change from horizontal to vertical. That is through 90 degrees. It, is, it has changed through 90 degrees. Determine the magnitude of the change in the linear momentum when the carriage moves from X to Y. Change in linear momentum. There was a momentum in the horizontal which was 580 times 22. There is now a momentum in the vertical which is 580 times times 12 because momentum changes from horizontal to vertical. Momentum is a vector quantity, so we find the resultant, and we shall find the resultant using Pythagoras theorem. So momentum P is mass times velocity. 
So the change in momentum is going to be the square root of, uh, in the horizontal it was 580 times 22. This is squared because it is Pythagoras theorem plus. In the horizontal, I mean the vertical it is 580 times 12 and we square this. We are using um, a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. I mean uh, c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. We are using Pythagoras theorem. So we check this with the calculator, uh, square root of, open brackets, I'll open the first bracket, 580 times 22, close the bracket squared, plus um, 580 times 12 squared, and I close that bracket, that is 1000, that is 14,534. 14,534 point something, which is approximately, we are going to move one, two, three, four steps. So that is 1.5 times 10 power 4 Newton seconds. State what is meant by rapidness, we are now used this force times displacement. In the direction of the force. Force times displacement in the direction of the force. That is work done. A square is pulled along a horizontal ground by a wire attached to a kite as shown in the figure. The square moves in a straight line along the, the ground with a constant speed of 4.4 meters per second. The wire is at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal, and the tension in the wire is 140 newtons. Actually, the work done by the tension, so work done is force times distance or displacement. So work done, because the tension is acting at an angle of 30 degrees, and yet motion in, is in the horizontal, we need to find the horizontal distance. So work done will be equal to the force in the horizontal times the distance. And the horizontal distance, the horizontal displacement, since distance is speed times time, the horizontal displacement, the speed in the horizontal is 4.4, and the time is 30 seconds. So the displacement is going to be 4.4 times 30 seconds. So this is going to be in meters. So it means the work done is going to be the force, which is, this force here must be resolved in the horizontal. Resolving that force in the horizontal, it will be 140 cos of 30. Then times the distance, which is 4.4 times, uh, times 30. We check with the calculator, 14, well, I mean 140 cos of 30. Then times 4.4 4, times 30. So that is 1,000, I mean 16,000, or 1. 1.6 times 10 power 4. So the work done is 1.6 times 10 power 4 in joules. The weight of the sky is 8, 16 newtons. Weight is acting vertically downwards. The vertical component of the tension in the wire and the weight of the sky are combined so that the sky exerts a downward pressure on the ground of 2, 400 pascals. Remember the weight is downwards, which is given as 860 newtons, but the vertical component of the tension is going to be 1,140 sine of 30. That is the vertical component. They are saying they combine to exert a pressure of 2,400 pascals. So which force exerts a pressure of 204 pascals? So the force which exerts pressure is going to be 860 downwards minus the component of the tension upwards, which is 140 
sine of 30. And I think 860 minus 140 sine 30 is 70. That gives us 790. So that is the force which exerts a pressure. And pressure is equal to force over area. So 790, sorry, that is not the pressure. The pressure is 2,400, should be equal to 790 divided by the area. So what is the area? So area equals 2, we just press the calculator, 2,400 divided by 790. And that is 3.0, is it 3.0? No, I divided wrongly. A, that will be 790 divided by 2400. That is 0 0.329, which is 0 0.33. So this would be 0 0.33 or 0 0.329 meters squared, which is approximately 0 0.33. So I made you make a the subject and find A by pressing your calculator. The wire attached to the kite is uniform. The stress in the wire is 9.6 times 10 power 6 pascals. Touch with the diameter of the wire. So we know that stress sigma is force over cross sectional area. That would be force over pi r squared, which would be force over, I'm removing r, so it would be pi into diameter over 2, but is squared, which becomes 4f divided by pi d squared. When I square d over 2, it becomes d squared over 4, so the 4 goes up. So the stress is 9.6 times 10 power 6, should be equal to 4. The force is 140 newtons, the tension in the cable, divided by pi times d squared. So it means the diameter d is going to be the square root of, I'm making d the subject, that would be 4 times 140, divided by pi times 9.6 times 10 power 6. So we shall check with our calculator. Square root of 4 times 140 divided by pi times 9.6 exponent 6 close the brackets so I get 4.3 times 10 power negative 3 so that is 4.3 times 10 power negative 3 so that will be the diameter the variation with the extension x of the tension f in the wire is shown in the figure here A gust of wind increases the tension in the wire from 140 to 210. Let's check 140. I think the scale here is um, 50 divided by 5. That is 10. The scale is 10. 140, we count 1, 2, 3, 4. That is 140. That is at 0 0.4. Then 210, count one small square. So that is 210. So the wind increases the tension in the wire from 140 to 210. Actually, the change in the strain energy stored in, this, in the wire, that is elastic potential energy. And we know that energy is equal to a half Fx, which is the same as a half Kx squared, which can be the same as the area under the graph. area under the graph because we want change change the energy i will use the first formula 
for uh, 0 0.4 against uh, 140, this is going to be, or well, I will just start with 0 0.6 because I want a change which is positive. So that would be a half times the force which is 210. The corresponding um, extension is 0 0.6 times 10 power negative 3 to change it to meters. That is the energy at 0 0.6 and 210 newtons minus. The other one is a half also times uh, the force which is 140 times uh, the extension which is 0 0.40 times 10 power negative 3. So we check this on the calculator. 0 0.5, that is a half times 210 times 0 0.6 exponent negative 3. Close the brackets minus. Open another bracket. 0 0.5 times 140 times 0 0.4 exponent negative 3. Close the bracket. So that is 0 0.035. You can easily find the area under the graph by taking it to be a trapezium. Area under the graph, taking it to be a trapezium. So we can say this is side A, so energy is going to be a half times A which is, uh, A will be there for 140 plus B which will be 210. Then times uh, what will be H is this distance here which is going to be 0 point, uh, that is 0 0.2 times 10 power negative 3. We can check also this. 140 plus 210 divided by 2. Then times 0 0.2 exponent negative 3. Which is 0 0.05. 0 0.035 joules. So that is uh, the change in strain energy. The variation with the extension x of the tension f in a spring is shown in the figure here. Calculate the energy stored in the spring for an extension of 4 centimeters. Explain your working. When they say explain your working, the energy stored is the area under the graph. Energy stored is equal to the area under area under the graph. Or oh, it can be the average force times extension. Average force, that is a half F times X. Average force times the extension. So let's use area under the graph. So that would be a half times what you would call the base. That is at 4.0. Extension is 4.0. So this is against... Um, Yeah, I think this is, because the scale is uh, 50 divided by 10, that is 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think that is 30, making this one 180. So this is going to be a half times 180 as the base. Times, oh, uh, the other one can be, is 4.0 times 10 power negative 2. One of them can be the base, another one can be the height. So we now press our calculator here to see the, the energy stored. Half is 0 0.5 times 180 times 4 exponent negative 2. 
which is 3.6 that is 3.6 joules the spring in a is used to join together two frictionless trolleys a and b as of mass m1 and m2 respectively as shown in the figure the trolleys rest on a horizontal surface and are held apart so that the spring is extended the trolleys are then released Explain why, as the extension of the spring is reduced, the momentum of the trolley A is equal in magnitude but opposed in direction to the direction of the momentum of trolley B. So because in, they were released, it means an initial momentum was zero. They were at rest. Therefore, even after release, they must, um, the momentum must be, they must move actually in opposite directions so that total momentum is still zero. So they are saying the, the momentum of trolley A is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the, total, to the momentum of trolley B. So one, we can say total momentum before release is zero. Total momentum before release is zero. So the sum of momenta, momenta is plural, the sum of momenta of the trolleys. after release must also be zero. So the sum of momenta of the trolleys after release must also be zero. Hence, it should be in opposite directions. Should be equal and in opposite directions. Okay, so that is, that is, uh, the, so since we want to conserve momentum after, after release, they must also have momentum in opposite directions so that the total sum is still zero. Okay. At the instant when the extension of the spring is zero, trolley A has speed V1 and trolley B has speed V2. Uh, write down an equation based on momenta to relate M1 and M2. Since the momenta are in opposite directions, they must be equal but opposite. So uh, we shall simply say M1 V1 should be equal to M2 times V2. equal but opposite. Then an equation to relate the initial kinetic energy E stored in the spring to the final energies of the trolley. Initial kinetic energies E should be equal to the final energies which are going to be a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared. So this is total kinetic energy after which is a half m1 v1 squared for the first trolley and a half m2 v2 squared for the second trolley. So total kinetic energy is equal to that. Is equal to the actual the initial kinetic energy E is equal to total kinetic energy after. We don't subtract energy. We don't subtract kinetic energy. Show that the kinetic energy EK of an object of mass m is related to its movement momentum by that equation. So kinetic energy is equal to a half m v squared. We know momentum is mass times velocity. So I make a V the subject here. 
This one implies that if V is equal to momentum divided by the mass. I go and substitute for V. So kinetic energy is equal to a half M. Where there is V, I put P over M. But this is squared. So it, when I simplify this, I have a half M P squared divided by M squared. So 1M cancels. Therefore, I have that E kinetic is equal to P squared divided by 2m as the kinetic energy. Trolley A has a larger mass than trolley B. Use your answer in 2 part 1 to deduce which trolley A or B has the larger kinetic energy at the instant when the extension of the spring is zero. So we just use we're just using uh, the answer in in part two where m1 v1 is equal to m2 v2 that means the momentum is the same momentum is the same so we are now using e k is equal to p squared over m since momentum is the same the one with the, a larger mass must be having a smaller kinetic energy so trolley b Trolley B What is the spelling of trolley? So trolley B has larger has larger kinetic energy Reason momentum is the same because um, momentum P is the same but B has a smaller mass. So from this expression, you see kinetic energy is inversely proportional to m. So because b has a smaller mass and yet the momentum is the same, a smaller mass means a larger kinetic energy, as simple as that. Explain what is meant by work done. We now know that work done is force times displacement in the direction of the force. Force times displacement in the direction of the force. Okay, let's look at this before we even move any further. A car is traveling along a, a long road that has a uniform downhill gradient. So it is at an angle of 7.5. So if its weight acts vertically downwards, that is mg. We can resolve the weight perpendicular to the plane and parallel to the plane. We're interested in parallel to the plane, and parallel to the plane will be mg sine. That will be mg sine 7.5, and the perpendicular to the plane, of course, will be mg cos 7.5, because this angle is 7.5. From symmetry, that angle is 7.5. So let's see now the questions. The car has a total mass of 850 kilograms. The angle of the road to the horizontal is 7.5 degrees. Calculate the component of the weight of the car down the slope. The component of the weight down the slope. So component of the weight down the slope. In other words, we resolve the weight parallel to the slope. So we have seen that that component of weight Is going to be equal to mg sine theta, which is mg's 850 
sorry, mass is 850. times 9.81 sine of 7.5 so we check our calculator uh, 850 times 9.81 sine of 7.5 which is 1088 which I will write as 1090 that is approximate 1088 which is 10.90. The car in B is traveling at a constant speed of 25 meters per second. The driver then applies the brakes to stop. Applies the brakes to stop. The car, the constant resisting, the constant force resisting the motion of the car is 4,600 newtons. Note that the component of the weight down the slope is 10.90. But there is a force, resistive force of 4,600 newtons resisting the motion in the opposite direction. That means the car is slowing down. That means the resistive force is greater than the component of the weight down the slope. So what is the resultant force causing a deceleration? So resultant force, which I will call F resultant, is going to be 4,600 minus 1090 which I think 4,600 minus 1090 is 3,510 newtons. This one is up the plane. In other words, it's in the opposite direction to motion. So the deceleration is going to be equal to the resultant force, which is 3,510 divide by uh, the uh, the mass I'm using f over m that is 850 so I divide this by 850 which is 4.1 meters per second Calculate the distance the car travels from when the brakes are applied until the car comes to, to rest. So this is the deceleration. We want the distance when at uh, the point of applying the brakes up to when it comes to rest. Of course, when it comes to rest, final velocity is zero. So we can use V squared equals to U squared plus 2AS. When it comes to rest, final velocity is zero. But at this point, it is moving with a speed which is uh, the brakes are applied when the car is moving at a speed of 25 meters per second. So this will be 25 squared plus 2. This is a deceleration, so I'll put a negative here. So times negative 4.1 times negative 4.1, then times the distance s. So it means S is going to be equal to 25 squared divided by, I think 2 times 4.1 is um, 8.2. So it is 25 squared divided by 8.2, which is 76, approximately 76 meters. Calculate the loss in kinetic energy of the car loss in kinetic energy. So we know kinetic energy is equal to a half m v squared. So this is going to be a half times the mass, which is 850, then times, um, remember its initial speed was 25, then it becomes, so I would say 25 squared. So this is the, the initial kinetic energy, but finally it becomes, zero, so I can say minus zero because the other one is zero. So this is going to be 0 0.5 times 850 times 25 squared, which is 2.7 times 10 power, uh, 2.7 times 10 power, I think power 5. So 2.7 times 10 power 5 joules. The work done by the resisting force of 4,600 newtons. We know that work done, 
is going to be equal to the force times the distance in the direction of the force. 4,600 newtons times the distance, which you have calculated as, I think this is 76. Let me check it again. 25 squared divided by 8.2. 76.2. So that is times 76. I'll just say times 76. Four thousand six hundred times 76. That is 3.5 times 10 power 5. 3.5 times 10 power 5 joules. The quantities in part 1, in, in a 3 part 1 and in three part two are not equal. Yes, they are not equal. This is 2.7, this is 3.5. It means there is more work done than the loss in um, than the loss in kinetic energy. So that means the difference must in most cases going to be the loss in potential energy. Explain why these two quantities are not equal. Of course, the difference is the loss in potential energy. The difference is the loss in potential energy. So the difference is going to account for the loss in potential energy. Okay. Explain what is meant by work done. Explain what is meant by work done. So we know work done is force times distance. I want to write always to be consistent with the displacement. It is force times displacement. In. The direction of the force. Force times displacement in the direction of the force. Then power. Power is the rate of doing work. Rate of work done or the work done by in time. Work done per unit time, that is power. The figure shows part of a fairground right from a carriage on rails. The carriage and the passengers have a total mass of 600 kilograms. The carriage is still is traveling at a speed of 9.5 meters per second towards a slope inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The carriage comes to rest after traveling up the vertical slope, vertical height of 4.1 meters. Calculate the kinetic energy in kilojoules of the carriage and passengers as they travel towards the slope. Kinetic energy. Before we move any further, we can find a distance up the slope, D. This is opposite. The distance is in hypotenuse, so that is sine of 30 is equal to the opposite, 4.10, divided by the distance D. So it means D is 4.1 divided by sine of 30. So let's find kinetic energy. So kinetic energy EK is equal to a half m v squared, which is going to be a half times 600 times V, which is 9.5 squared. That is the kinetic energy as they travel towards the slope. So we just press our calculator. A half times 600 times 9.5 squared. So that is 27,075 uh, 27, joules. We want the answer in kilo. So that is 27,075. So that is 27 kilojoules, approximately 27 kilojoules. 
or 27 times 10 power 3. Then show that the gain in potential energy of the carriage and the passenger is 24 kilojoules. So potential energy, we know potential energy is m g h. So this is going to be 600 for the mass times 9.81, then h is 4.1. We check the calculator, 600 times 9.81 times 4.1. So that is 2,000, I mean 24,000, 132 joules, 132.6, or 133 joules, which is 24 kilojoules, approximately 24 kilojoules. Calculate the work done against the resistive force as the carriage moves up the slope. Work done against, this is the gain in potential energy, this is uh, the kinetic energy, with which it, re it, uh, it reaches the slope. So you see the, kin the loss in kinetic energy is not equal to the gain in kinetic uh, potential energy. So there's some work done against resistance. And that work done is simply going to be 27 minus 24, which is equal to 3.0 kilojoules. So this is 3.0. So let's end here with the part one with this question. Use your answer in part two, part three to calculate the resistive force acting against the carriage. So resistive force, we need to uh, work done is equal to force times distance. We want the work done again, I mean the resistive force. We have already got the distance. The distance is equal is got from is equal to 4.1 over sine of 30. So the resistive force resistive force is going to be the work done divided by the distance. The work done is 3 kilojoules that is 3000 divided by the distance which is uh, 4.1 divided by sine of 30. 3000 divided by 4.1 divided by sine of 30. So that is 365.8, approximately 366. So this is 366 newtons. So I want part one to stop here because. Okay, see you in part two. Bye bye.